Good evening or good morning, depending where you are as you've tuned in to this evening's extraordinary event. Uh, my name is Dennis Kretz. I have the honor to serve as the director of the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Texas at Dallas. When we began the Center for Asian Studies in 2019, one of our founding goals was to be able to bring together scholars with both a Chinese and a Western perspective to together provide a balanced commentary on global issues. This evening or morning, we have the rare opportunity to achieve that goal with just one guest, one cosmopolitan, thoughtful, and authoritative speaker. Dr. Wang Huiyao pursued his graduate studies at the University of Western Ontario and the University of Manchester, both in the Americas and Europe. Meanwhile, he served as a senior fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute. In China, he has held multiple high-level positions, above all as founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. The author of numerous books, he has emerged as a leading and deeply reasoned observer of China and its ascending role in the world. Recently, I watched an informative and absorbing conversation that he had with the American political commentator, Thomas Friedman. And Dr. Wang is sought after for conversations and for his thoughts about the role of China in relation to the United States. And now we have the privilege of hearing him address the issue of United States-China relations in the context of global governance. On a personal note, we at the University of Texas at Dallas Center for Asian Studies are honored to have Dr. Wang as a member of our International Advisory Council. To welcome him, at least virtually, to Dallas, I am asking the chair of our council, my friend Dr. Dashwan Fang, to say a few words. Dashwan. Uh, <clears throat> good evening or good morning. Uh, I'm particularly uh, excited and honored to have uh, the opportunity to say a few words welcoming Dr. Wang Huiyao. Uh, I've known Dr. Wang, we met once in Taiwan when uh, the first time. And, uh, and I've of course followed his illustrious career in becoming a very important person speaking about global issues, especially between United States and China. Some mostly from the Chinese perspective, but usually also with a global flavor. Uh, his most recent conversations with Thomas Friedman, uh, as also with Graham Allison, I think are two of the most remarkable examples of how our two nations should engage in conversations. So tonight, I think we will hear from him a very interesting perspective that we don't hear very much in the United States. So here we have Dr. Wang. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Krasi and uh, Dr. Da uh, uh, Feng, and uh, it's really a great honor, extremely honor to uh, to be uh, with uh, with you and uh, your colleagues, and also the uh, uh, viewers online. And uh, so, good morning and good evening as well. I'm I'm in uh, 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 actually in, in Guangzhou today, and uh, oh. yeah, and uh, it's uh, at the Nansha in Guangzhou. So. Uh, but uh, it's really a great honor to uh, to, to be here, and uh, uh, I, I think the the topic that uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Krasi and uh, Dr. Dajian Feng recommended to me is that talk something about uh, U.S. China, and uh, absolutely uh, important that we uh, need to have more dialogues. Uh, we have more uh, exchanges. I mean, during this uh, probably a difficult time, but also at, at the crossroads. So. So the topic I would like to talk about uh, really the, the China-US relations, but also how we can really work together uh, on that. 
Uh, what I actually see now, for example, this year is the, uh, the 50 year, 50th year of uh, anniversary of uh, Dr. Kissinger uh, uh, break his uh, first visit to China. And also it's the uh, 50th uh, years of anniversary of China joining the UN, basically <laughs> come back to, to the multiple world. And also it's the 20 years uh, anniversary of China joining WTO. So you can see for the last half century and particularly for the last 20 years, China has changed profoundly and uh, China has really embraced the globalization. And I see that uh, it's really, we have been uh, uh, seen uh, many times over the, the changes taking place uh, in China and, and with the world. So, so the, uh, however, for the last uh, number of years, I, I see that uh, uh, we, we also have some uh, difficulties now and uh, with uh, Western countries, particularly the U United States. I think there's a lot of uh, probably misunderstanding and there's a lot of uh, uh, structural differences. Uh, as uh, Dan Xuan said, I, I, was, I was giving, a, a, I was hosting a dialogue with uh, Tom Friedman, uh, the world is flat uh, author. And uh, basically, we, we, we are saying that, you know, we need more understanding of each other. And also with uh, Graham Allison, uh, uh, a former uh, colleague at Harvard. So we, how we can really, uh, to avoid the trap. Uh, so for, 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 for US and China, we have actually established diplomatic ties for the last 41 or 42 years. So that's really uh, the year of China opening up, uh, ushered in by Deng Xiaoping was in, uh, 1978. So in 1978, in, in, in December, uh, 19, November, December, China had its uh, third plenum of the uh, 11th uh, Party Congress, where that, at that conference, uh, China decided to, to opening up. And on January 1st uh, of 1979, China and the US established a diplomatic ties. So you can see the strategic decision they made at the end of 1978, where China is you know, make sure to open. Uh, and then they established diplomatic ties on January 1st with, uh, with US, it's, it's, such, it's not a coincidence. So, so I think that China embraced the world and China is really uh, uh, really willing to work with the, the, the largest economy and still the largest economy of the United States. And I see that this kind of open atmosphere, this open uh, exchanges and uh, has created many without. For example, China now is the uh, uh, U.S. largest student sending country. We, we, we have about 400,000 students uh, study in the United States. And also China uh, had a tourism. <laughs> you know, before the pandemic, China every year has 3 million tourists uh, visit the United States. And also uh, U.S. companies doing great business in China. We, we see uh, uh, the U.S. company, uh, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of them, uh, thousands of them probably working in China and then uh, generate over, uh, you know, billions of dollars of business in China as well. I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the China is Apple's second largest market, uh, it's growing largest market. And uh, uh, also we see t Tesla is, has a, a bigger, uh, more, more than flat, uh, plant in China has been generated great uh, stuff. Uh, but also we see that uh, uh, China is already um, uh, has a lot of investment on both sides as well. So uh, uh, the, 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 the economic integration is enormous and that's really created the world prosperity, I, I think. Uh, for example, China uh, contributed over, over one third of the global GDP growth and China has been able to lift 800 million people out of poverty, which represents 70% of poverty reduction on a global basis. Uh, and China is actually uh, ahead of the UN 2030 agenda, uh, uh, 10 years ahead of that time uh, on the number one priority of lifting lift, lift poverty. So, so I think that uh, uh, somehow, uh, of course, uh, we, we are facing a lot of challenge. Now. Uh, what I think that that happened is that, uh, you know, both China and the US are huge uh, countries. We have a lot of, uh, uh, differences, um, uh, of course, uh, culturally, uh, historically, ideologically, and also uh, there is normally, uh, as Graham Allison has been saying that, you know, when the uh, rising power uh, is, uh, is catching up with the ruling power, there are bound to be some kind of a, uh, some, some, some uh, conflict, but, 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 but let's try to avoid that. 
so uh, so uh, what what I think is actually uh, this got a bit of, uh, deteriorated in the last uh, uh, four or five years, particularly I think since uh, 2017, when the U.S. has actually uh, issued this strategic report that labeled the China as a strategic rivalry. I mean, uh, the first year when Trump uh, took office uh, in 2017. I mean, that was issued by the National Security Advisor, H.R. Uh, uh, McMaster then. And he and I actually had a debate at the Monk debate uh, uh, in 2019 in Toronto with 3,000 audience. Uh, the topic of debate is that, is China a threat to the global, uh, uh, liberal global system? Uh, which I definitely don't think so. And we actually managed to win that debate, even, even with a, uh, not a big margin, but we actually, you know, not uh, you know, convinced the audience on the spot that uh, China is not. What, what, I, what I would like to say is that, uh, you know, that kind of a uh, consensus has been built up uh, in the last several decades, uh, in, in the last uh, several uh, years, sorry. And then um, there, are some, there are always some problem in the last several decades. But I think China and US has been able to manage uh, quite well their, their, their differences. There's a, I think there's a bottom lines, there's a, you know, uh, you know, sovereign uh, issues and things like that. So uh, what, what, I, what I think uh, I, I'm really, uh, 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 you know, surprised to see actually, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that, uh, uh, so if China is not converged with US as some people may say that then, uh, that this relationship gets really uh, deteriorated. But I, I think a lot of business, both in the US and China, are not happy with that. Uh, a lot of uh, students are not happy with that. Tourism is not happy with that. So, so the topic, uh, I, I think the challenge of today is how we can really maintain the relationship. And, uh, and of course, uh, while we handle uh, our differences well. Uh, what I see now, actually, is through the Alaska meeting and recently uh, with the new Biden administration, I see some, some changes, actually, compared with what has been in the uh, Trump administration. As I said, Trump administration labeled China as a uh, strategic uh, rivalry. And uh, whereas I think I watched uh, President Biden's speech at the uh, Munich Security Conference uh, with heads of, uh, uh, you know, Atlantic uh, heads of, the, of, the, of all the country, Western countries, Actually, at that, at that conference, at that summit online, uh, CCG and my think tank, our Secretary General, Dr. Miao, was invited to, to raise a question uh, for the heads of the state uh, uh, there uh, on, on the screen as well with all the leaders there. And uh, uh, so we, 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 we hear the Biden speech there basically saying, OK, uh, U.S. Is, uh, is going to work with the allies. U.S. is going to um, build up this, uh, 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 you know, probably uh, more uh, democratic form, and also uh, U.S. is uh, is recognized as a competition with China, even fierce competition. He didn't he didn't use the word rivalry. He said competition, strategic competition. But he's also said that there's a cooperation. He actually said that uh, <laughs> there's a cooperation. So I think that's a better word that uh, he has been using. Where I don't see uh, in in Trump administration. So that's really uh, I I I view that as a, as a more uh, uh, balanced view. Uh, so uh, obviously, big countries like China, U.S., there's, there's bound to be area that they, 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 they are, there's a copy, copy, competition. There's an area they can cooperate. Uh, we're facing the whole world a lot of challenges. What what I actually uh, see President Biden did is is uh, is quite uh, you know quite uh, you know forthcoming. For example, uh, the uh, the first uh, order he signed when he comes back to the White House, he he he, he resumed. Uh, uh, climate change deal, and uh, he actually uh, also signed some kind of order that banning the use of uh, ethnic or, or nationality language to re refer uh, the pandemic virus, COVID-19, which basically abandoned what Trump has been doing all along, calling China virus. And I, I, actually, I think he's, he sent an enormous uh, friendly message to China at, uh, uh, you know, New Year's Eve. When, when he had the president, uh, Xi and the president Biden had a two hours <laughs> dialogue on the eve of Chinese New Year. I, I, so, and also say Happy New Year to the Chinese. So, so I think that has been really uh, well received in China. And, uh, and also, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, they also, the, the two heads actually 
had uh, had uh, uh, a lot of a dialogue. They had, they've been knowing each other for for many years. As they said, they are probably the longest, uh, uh, you know, knowing the leaders and spend most of the time, uh, quality time, uh, while they both since they were both vice president. Uh, so I think there's there's some top leadership and standing there. That's why we had this Alaska meeting. Of course, the Alaska meeting, I think, at the at the, at the opening part, didn't really go as uh, all we expected. But as uh, as uh, uh, you know, the uh, I, I think when I dialogue with uh, with Tom Friedman, uh, basically he said both sides need to clear their throat <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, so so there could be some uh, 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 you know uh, 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 you know harsh dialogue at the beginning. But I think you know uh, what I can see actually what I heard also I read the statement from. Chinese Foreign Minister Affairs on their website is that uh, you know the the, the closed door meeting probably went went still okay and uh, went well. They they've been talking on many uh, issues, and furthermore, we are very happy to see uh, uh, the former Secretary of State John Kerry, the Spanish envoy of President uh, Biden. Uh, uh, John Kerry is visiting China actually. Uh, you know in in a, Next few days, probably next week, and uh, so 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 we're really happy to see that. And uh, uh, I met uh, uh, Secretary John Kerry um, last year at the Munich Security Conference. He came to my uh, round table where uh, CCG was holding at uh, Munich Security Conference, and he gave a very great speech there. Uh, so so I think you know uh, for the climate change, China and the U.S. has to work together. We cannot uh, uh, dodge our <laughs> responsibility, and also maybe we should uh, demonstrate some uh, moral leadership for that. Being two largest, uh, uh, you know, carbon emission countries, and uh, so 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 now come to the, the uh, so that's basically the opening uh, of my uh, uh, the, the, the the you know this this uh, talk. What I want to say now is that what what where do we go from here? Uh, what what do we assess the China-U.S. relation and what can be done on both sides on the, on the China-U.S. relation and also on the on the future on the global governance, for example? So so I think now uh, uh, probably the China-U.S. relation will not go back to the to the uh, you know false illusions that we we may have in the past, but maybe we should really think about this as. Uh, 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 great, uh, you know, how we can embrace these uh, coming decades and uh, how we can really, uh, you know, seek the common ground and minimize the differences and really try to be uh, peacefully coexistence uh, with each other. So what I see now with uh, both Trump administration and the Biden administration and, and, and Chinese government is that uh, now they both recognize there is a com competition. Uh, so we see Secretary Blinken, we see uh, President Biden has been saying quite a few times, you know, we're going to compete with China, which is fine. You know, China, China wel welcomes competition. I mean, in, in, a, in a, a friendly terms, always competition makes the world go around. I mean, we, uh, we always welcome that. And uh, so I think uh, for the Chinese uh, for Mr. Wang Yi, he actually said that this year, uh, National People's Congress uh, news conference that uh, China now recognized there's competition uh, we, 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 we certainly uh, welcomes that. But also, I think both governments emphasize there's an area of cooperation. Uh, so uh, using the uh, uh, term of, uh, of uh, Joseph Nye, he, he, he called this as a competition, you know, and, and so using the word of Graham Allison is uh, a cooperative rivalry. And uh, so, so I think, you know, the, our rivalry partnership. So I think, you know, something like that, probably we're going to be there uh, you know, whether we can reach the status of uh, uh, EU countries, like, uh, like, like if you talk about economy, if you talk about rising, EU probably, European Union probably is the largest uh, economic power in the world. But European Union doesn't have the problem with US on, on its track. So why China should have that? So, so, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, what, can we really uh, have a peaceful uh, competition and uh, uh, but but also uh, friendly cooperation uh, that really is the uh, ideal objective. So I think this uh, this cop competition uh, uh, you know uh, narrative, which I think now is uh, is uh, replaced uh, what uh, uh, President Biden has been talking in the past about uh, uh, you know uh, strategic rivalry or, or, or 
or, or, or this kind of a very negative scent and or CPC is, is ruling or whatever. So, so I think, you know, they, we, we, we probably have a, have a, uh, a reasonable, uh, uh, good start. I really hope that, uh, you know, when jo Secretary uh, John Kerry come to China uh, next, next week and we can really uh, start some cooperation, you know, for example, on the, uh, on the uh, 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 climate change. And President Biden is having this climate change summit on, a, on the World Earth Day on April uh, 22nd. So, so uh, he has invited the 40 heads of state uh, to uh, to attend, um, including uh, uh, President Xi. So, so I'm sure that when they have this uh, you know virtual face to face meeting, uh, that would be really great. Uh, probably better than telephone calls that uh, uh, they can really talk about. And then, and and Secretary, uh, you know, uh, John Kerry is actually uh, come to Beijing. I'm sure they, they they are going to work on that. And also, China and the U.S. actually. Uh, uh, is already taking uh, on, on uh, working on the uh, as a leading uh, group, uh, uh, leading countries for the G20 working group on climate change. So both the U.S. and China already talk on that, uh, uh, you know, for, for for recently now. So so which is a good again uh, uh, another new sign of the two countries, you know, trying to work together. And also I I, I noticed that uh, the Semiconductor Association of China, but also U.S. has actually starting some kind of working relationship. Uh, so, so we, 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 while we maintain our differences, while we're trying to understand each other better, uh, but I think we really need to build up the trust. We really need to, uh, uh, you know, start from uh, uh, you know, those common challenges and also pandemic uh, fighting as well. I mean, uh, I see that uh, President Xi actually last year uh, uh, pledged the two billion U.S. dollars in fighting uh, COVID-19 with developing countries with WHO. I'm very glad to see uh, that uh, President Biden at the G7 summit also pledged two billion US dollars uh, for uh, fighting pandemics through uh, 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 with developing countries and WHO. And also, he USA said, you know, if needed, they can they can continue to support. So those shows really demonstrate a great leadership, I think, from the US side and uh, on these global uh, uh, pandemic fighting issues. Uh, I, I'm also glad to see the vaccine. Uh, Injection progress is is doing well in the U.S. Probably has the highest uh, percentage of uh, people getting injected for for vaccine uh, than any other countries now. Uh, so so you see when Biden takes actions, uh, he he really uh, I think stopped the isolated uh, isolation that previous government was was trying to was was actually created. He has uh, re demonstrated his leadership and also he has gained a lot of allies back. Uh, but but also uh, uh, you know start this dialogue with China. So so I think it, it's really uh, uh, well noted on that. Uh, so that's the, the 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 thing. The first point I want to raise is this competition. Uh, uh, new thinking could probably uh, we hope that they're going to be there to stay, and that that probably can, can guide us into a more a pragmatic, realistic, um, a cooperative uh, kind of a mode. The second point I want to make is that. Uh, uh, China is, is not what uh, probably the old traditional way of thinking of or CPC or Communist Party of China, or whatever. Probably, you know, anyone who came to China, I mean, uh, uh, has been saying that what has happened in the China in the last four decades is really a miracle. I mean, probably took uh, many developed countries uh, over 100 years or over several centuries to develop. China has really transformed. Uh, China uh, beyond recognition for any uh, uh, you know uh, visitors or any any people without really prejudice on that. Uh, for example, now uh, China has the, uh, uh, the you know it's become the second largest economy in the world. China is now the trade uh, largest trading nation with 130 countries now. China has uh, probably last year actually even contributed to the 50% of the world GDP goes during the pandemic year. It's the only economy to keep the major uh, only major economy keep the positive GDP growth. And China has really uh, already uh, 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 one of the significant, according to the World Bank and, and, uh, and the UN, that China has lifted over 800 million people out of poverty. That's an enormous China. Just imagine if China hasn't done well, China would probably like uh, some Middle East countries and export uh, refugees, export famine, 
that probably would be even bigger devastating to the world <laughs> than what has happened in China now. And uh, so China is, is, uh, is uh, now uh, also in terms of uh, infrastructure, China is doing extremely well. China has uh, built uh, 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 two thirds of a, a, a world as a fast train network. So anywhere you go in China these days, it's just a few hours from Beijing to Guangzhou, you know, five, six hours, uh, Beijing to Shanghai, four hours. And uh, so basically the whole country is within your reach during, during one day, uh, anywhere you go. So, uh, and also uh, China has uh, one billion smartphone users uh, and uh, China has actually uh, built up the 5 million 4G network and about 1 million 5G network. So, so, you know, technology-wise, China is expanding very fast. And also China uh, has, uh, has uh, one of the remarkable things I think that China has done is uh, uh, China has uh, provided a basic Medicare for 1.3 billion people. That's probably the largest medical uh, uh, coverage in the world. And then uh, provided the social security, some basic social security for over 1 billion uh, population. So see uh, the, the, the gain uh, uh, of the uh, daily life is, is, is really the, uh, the, the substantial uh, you know, achievement. So China is trying to avoid this gap between rich and poor. So that's why uh, the current government, I mean, things uh, uh, 2012, uh, when, when President Xi uh, uh, took over, they are emphasizing on elevating property. I mean, that, that's how they have done it, lifted 800 million people out of property. That's enormous. Uh, uh, you know, I think achievement for the mankind. And of course, uh, but also we see uh, other countries, you know, with population is rising. And uh, so that's really unfortunate because uh, the problem for that, I think is that, uh, you know, the, the gap between rich and poor is getting wider, you know, not only in the United States where probably 1% of Wall Street equals to almost 50% of the general population's wealth and in many other countries too. So. So China has realized that challenge. China has really trying to uh, you know, avoid this extreme poverty so that there won't be too much uh, uh, social unrest in China. So, so I think you know, that, that is really uh, been doing well. And also China is, uh, is uh, 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 doing on this pandemic fighting as well. And China realized that the, the, the virus first broke out in Wuhan and China has, uh, has uh, paid an enormous price for that. They shut down 11 million uh, metropolitan for three months, basically shut down, you can't get out of your home. <laughs> and then uh, shut down a 60 million uh, Hubei province. And the whole country really, uh, uh, you know, they've done a lot of experiment, you know, quarantine, you know, social distance and, uh, uh, you know, massive uh, testing and uh, screening big data. So finally, China has managed a way of containing virus. Uh, these days, uh, there's, there's no basically very, you know, very rare have a local uh, occurrence of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, so, so everything back to normal, basically the tourism, the, uh, the people come to work. So, so I think, you know, uh, the, the, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm going to say there's a lot of cultural difference because China is a society, thousands of years practice the, you know, some kind of collectivism. Uh, so that, uh, you know, people willing to sacrifice a, a bit of the individual freedom for the sake of the community and uh, for the, for the well being of the, of the public of the state. Whereas I think in Western countries, there is a lot of individualism was stressed, individual freedom, human right and everything. So that's why you see, uh, you know, things probably uh, you know, wasn't really uh, ideally controlled. So, so in the 21st century, we have to give a lot of thought. Uh, on the on the old uh, thinking, uh, old um, uh, model of governance in the past uh, that has been uh, you know for the last uh, 100, 200 years when, when the economy wasn't that developed, uh, when, um, when, when you know I mean one best way to, 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 to make a decision is really have a uh, one, one, one vote. But I think you know what China has done is they, they have been practicing consultative democracy, there is also a technology democracy. I call it technology democracy. Basically, everybody has a mobile phone. Everywhere you, <laughs> anywhere you go, anything you buy, what, who to see, what to, what to do. I mean, you are voting every, every, every moment uh, with your mobile phone. And also, it's a market democracy. You know, the, the economy you can really produce whatever you want, and then um, uh, very, uh, very uh, sufficient competition. China probably developed a kind of unique uh, hybrid model of its economy, you know, with 70% private sector, 
60 to 70 percent private sector you know entrepreneurs and then you have about uh, 15 percent multinationals you know all the big multinational 500 14 500 all in china and then you have another 15 probably 20 percent of soe where they do a lot of uh, you know um, uh, basic work for for covering the rural area for example the telecom you have to go to the rural area you can't charge very much so they fulfill a lot of social responsibilities on that. So I think this kind of model has really sustained China uh, pretty well. And also China has this uh, uh, word practice, thousands of years of the culture of uh, meritocracy. So any official, you can't just rise in from one speech or several speech or one campaign. You rise, you rise through the ranks of it being a, 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 you know, a rural uh, or a township or a, a county <laughs> official, become a municipality and become a province. Uh, become ministry and then become uh, come to the top. So they accumulated a lifetime experience of, of you know, public servant doing the, uh, all kind of management experience. So you see that's where uh, everywhere now uh, they have this uh, great uh, challenge, uh, you know, balance and check on the, on the officials and meritocracy. You have to put publish your resume on, 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 on all the major media when, before you promote it. And then you have uh, uh, also opening of, of that any, any, organization promote the official, they have a one month of, um, uh, uh, you know, so-called display notice, uh, put it in, in a public domain. And if this guy has any problem, corruptions or uh, uh, any, any dirty things, they, they'll be exposed. They will be, they will be, uh, you know, the, 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 they can be really um, uh, 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 changed or replaced or even punished. So, so, so I think, you know, this kind of a system uh, really with one five-year plan after another five-year plan, it's really made the China, uh, you know, consistently uh, working very, very uh, fast uh, without uh, this, this, inter this uh, interruption of, uh, you know, party debates and, uh, and a lot of a uh, debate, but then really can't get things done. So, so I think, you know, there's a lot of public merit to this kind of system uh, where I think the Fukuyama-san uh, uh, was right. I mean, it's, it's not the end of history. We probably should tolerate about different model, different system. Uh, just as Deng Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter if it's black and white or white, uh, or white cat, uh, as long as cat is mice. So if this system can deliver uh, the well-being for 1.4 billion people, if this system can, can really create a lot of uh, uh, you know, wealth and, and contribute over one third of a global GDP growth, probably we need to you know, give a bit of a, you know, uh, more, more, more tolerance of that. And, but of course, China is, uh, has to also, uh, you know, has this global responsibility, needs to really uh, demonstrate some, uh, some uh, you know, responsibility to the world as well. For example, China now become the second largest donor to the United Nations. China actually, the Chinese vaccine has been, um, you know, uh, injected in over 60, 70 countries now. China trying to provide some public goods on that. And China is, uh, is uh, also, um, you know, uh, I mean, I mean, of course, there's there's still way for China to catch up uh, uh, in terms of uh, how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, make more contribution to the world. But 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 basically, I think China is uh, having all those uh, 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 you know um, things in mind is how we can uh, work with uh, with all the countries together. Uh, of course, there's there's a huge cultural differences. One of the things I I think that uh, we, we are very uh, 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 I'm fortunate to see is that uh, the tourism coming to China is, is really <laughs> getting smaller compared with, uh, with 12 years ago, when, uh, 13 years ago when they had the Beijing Olympic. It's still kept at the Beijing Olympic level. Uh, while China's outbound tourism has been, uh, you know, double, triple or quadruple many, many times uh, with one, over 150 million people out of China's uh, you know, boundary and, uh, you know, 150 million people returned, not, not, not no people stayed overseas. So you can see the attraction of China these days. The people still uh, like the, uh, to, to, to stay here and feel uh, very, uh, you know, working fine in this big country. And, and what, I, what I, would, I, I hope that is that we should have more international visits come to China. We have, should have more academic exchanges. I really hope there will be more U.S. students studying in China. There's only about uh, 10,000 uh, U.S. students studying in China, where they have 400,000 as Chinese students studying in the U.S. We hope to have more tourism. Uh, we hope to have more dialogue. But also, I think the other thing is that China probably needs to uh, upgrade its uh, narrative as well. We, we need to really uh, have a new theory, maybe have a new explanation of what has been done right in China. 
uh, where we have problems, where we need to overcome. Uh, maybe we can have a more international uh, uh, dialogue. We probably should mobilize all the uh, players, you know, uh, NGOs, academics, uh, think tanks, and uh, social, um, uh, cultural, uh, you know, art, artistic, all, the, all those exchanges. We should really strengthen that. That's probably the best uh, uh, for, for, for our, uh, uh, you know, those countries. So that's that's the second part I would like to say is the this uh, you know China has been uh, rising or has been developing, but there seems there's a there's a there's a, there's a gap in uh, in both interpreting and explanation uh, on both sides. You know, uh, I hope that uh, you know we could uh, uh, do better on that and we could have more uh, uh, find a better way to understanding of each other. Uh, thirdly, uh, I would like to say you know on on the on global uh, cooperation with. Uh, U.S. and China, and uh, I think U.S. and China has has enormous uh, areas to collaborate. I mean, we have uh, uh, you know this uh, uh, President Biden actually basically won his election uh, largely on two uh, promises. One is uh, fighting pandemic. I think he really he he has delivered that. He has uh, you know he has quickly had this big campaign. Uh, to to fulfill his uh, his uh, uh, you know has so many Americans get injected a vaccine and things like that, and then the second is climate change. He see this really uh, as as his mission. He, the first exact order he signed is to return to to uh, to climate change uh, uh, Paris Agreement. So he 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 is within hundred days of his office. He's calling this uh, uh, basically this uh, global uh, climate change summit, uh, inviting forty heads of state to to. to to, to, to have that meeting. He demonstrated his, uh, his leadership there. I, I think, you know, so, so those areas really needs to work with China. Uh, uh, both pandemic, China has already developed a model or a pattern of how to contain the virus. Uh, maybe some, uh, some uh, methodology adopted, but maybe uh, culture-wise, uh, maybe different in, in, in China and Western countries. But some are probably, uh, uh, you know, universal, like uh, uh, quarantine, social distance, and uh, you know, massive testing and things like that can be applied. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of area that uh, China and the US can work together to really to help the whole world uh, to stop this pandemic. We we are really having this huge challenge on that, uh, and also climate change. And uh, China being the largest uh, carbon emission country, and, and US being the second largest, both country has the uh, uh, you know, uh, duties and uh, responsibility to really uh, work together. Uh, I, I think when President uh, Biden was uh, was running for the office in last November, uh, President Xi actually delivered his uh, speech at the UN uh, summit that for the first time China announced that China is going to achieve a, a, a carb carbon uh, uh, peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutral before uh, 2060. Uh, we, 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 we need to notice that is before, not by, we have, President Xi said before. So we don't know how many years can be before, but, but that actually China has set a target for that for the first time. And actually on the, you know, this year is the 14 years, uh, uh, five years plan. The first year of 14th, five years plan. It's also a sec, uh, first year of a second centennial goal. See, China has a, a centennial goal. The first centennial goal has achieved the last year which means that uh, they have already lifted 800 million people out of poverty. So, so I think that uh, in the new 14th five years plan, they are sp spare out all the details of how we can uh, ta reach target again. And, uh, you know, cut down thermal, cut down the emission. People actually often doubt if China can, uh, can achieve that. Um, I, I always give an example of, of Beijing, uh, where I lived, uh, uh, you know, uh, most of the time. For example, in Beijing, uh, 10 years ago, Beijing is polluted by this heavy smoke. Uh, uh, people really was, uh, was uh, really uh, uh, worried and, and uh, scared and choked. <laughs> See, this Beijing smoke is so famous. But, the, you know, the, 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 I think since the, the 18th Party Congress, actually, the one, the new leadership comes up, they have been proposing a, a new concept, basically saying that um, uh, green mountains and uh, blue waters are the gold mountains, are the, are the silver mountains. So, so basically, you know, they, they realize that it's how, how badly the environment are. So, so they can really uh, 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 take actions on that. 
so they shut down many thermal plants and uh, cement plants or those heavy polluted plants around Beijing. And uh, so, so now you, you, you come to Beijing, you, you know, basically you don't see much of the smoke uh, in the whole year now, and the, the, the climate has greatly improved. Uh, so, so it shows how, how effective Chinese government can, can, can make things happen. So, so I, I think when, when top leadership said that they want to achieve uh, carbon neutral before uh, 2060, you know, they, they, they mean it, they, they have to do it. And uh, so, so I think that is really great. And uh, uh, so, so, so President Biden is calling this summit. I'm, I'm sure uh, John Kerry now uh, will, will visit China soon and they will prepare an agenda. I'm sure they're going to have a quite a good discussion uh, at the summit, and also they're going to have uh, some leading uh, consensus probably to promote that at the G20 summit uh, later this year. So, so that's that's something I, I see. Uh, but but also I want to say that uh, the other area, in, in addition to the climate change, we we want to see the uh, the, uh, the, the the global uh, the governance. We need really upgrade for that. For example, during the Second World War. Uh, after the Second World War, we had the Britain Wood Conference system, where we had the UN established uh, World Bank, IMF, uh, WTO, uh, GATT uh, was then. So, so you see this uh, American-led, uh, UK-led, this first generation of global governance has really worked well. But now I think um, after 76 years of that running, I mean, we really need to upgrade this system uh, to really fill the, uh, the uh, shortage of that. Uh, so can we have a new Britain Wood moment? Uh, I really see a, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities there. For example, the, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure. President Biden just recently passed a, a 2.3 to $3 trillion uh, bill calling for upgrade American infrastructure. And this is not a, a limited American. All the, all the Western world, all the uh, developing, vast developing countries having this huge challenge of infrastructure. So, so, so even though we haven't had a, a, a world war to, to upgrade system, we had a worldwide uh, virus war, actually. So the, 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 this worldwide pandemic will make us thinking how we can have a more green uh, economy, how we can have a great infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is the, probably the least ideological and has most consensus. I mean, at least in the US, in addition to the bipartisan consensus on China, there is a bipartisan consensus on infrastructure. They, they, they all felt there's a need for infrastructure upgrade. And uh, for example, we're talking to uh, um, you know, scholars at the Texas University. The infrastructure, for example, US and China have this trade deal, first one phase trade deal. And uh, uh, you know, uh, US wants China to buy a lot of energy uh, product from, from, from US, either from Alaska or from Texas. But uh, I, I noticed that uh, the, the energy export from inland Texas to the Texas port, uh, the price of that is, is double the price from port to China because the inland of Texas, there's not enough uh, sufficient infrastructure to, ex, you know, to, to, to ship all the energy product to the, to, the, <laughs> to the port and then the port ship them to China. So, so you see there's a huge opportunity for, for infrastructure cooperation as well. So what I can uh, propose is that, uh, you know, uh, since there's a world consensus on infrastructure, and that could be leading us for the next several decades to basically to work on, uh, we have uh, some common object objective to work on. And China has already given a lot of experience on that. US has a lot of international uh, experience and, and all those countries. So can we really, uh, I'm thinking, can we set up an a, a international um, infrastructure investment bank or global infrastructure investment bank? Uh, one of the easy way probably is that we can we can upgrade uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and we can invite uh, uh, U.S. and Japan to join that and, and jointly consult it and uh, to work on that. Because uh, 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 this AIB has already 103 uh, international uh, members, the largest membership. Uh, it's already become the second largest multilateral lending agency. It it has all the Western country in it. Uh, EU, German, uh, UK, uh, you know, France and Australia, Canada, you know, all the, Jap all the, all the, all the Western countries, uh, except US and Japan. So, so I think, you know, uh, if we upgrade this uh, uh, global infrastructure investment bank from AIB, then we can really tackle the infrastructure shortage worldwide. And that probably uh, gave us another new uh, momentum, new drive 
uh, object for us to, to fulfill. So, so I think we need to create a lot of common uh, object, a common uh, uh, working uh, uh, plan, you know, uh, fighting, fighting pandemic, uh, controlling climate change, and build the world into a better place uh, with the infrastructure. So, so I think in, in this area, I think China and US can, can really collaborate probably, and uh, we can really work together uh, to upgrade this global system upgrade this global governance system. Uh, I mean, the World Bank and everybody's done fine, but the World Bank and other development banks have also has other challenges, uh, poverty elevation, green development, climate change. But I think now we have, uh, one of the experience China has, is China has really worked on, on infrastructure for the last four decades. And then this infrastructure has really shortened the distance, has really greatly uh, produced the efficiency, productivity, uh, uh, everybody has a, 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 a you know mobile phone on hand. It's like everybody has a small ERP. You know everybody efficiency uh, has greatly improved, and there's a synergy of that with all the infrastructure in place. You know, for example, out of the ten largest port, uh, seven of them are in China. You know, out of all the tourist bridges in the world, eighty percent of them are in China. So, so I think you know this kind of experience China has can also uh, benefit other world as well. But we need the world to work together on that. I think U.S. is always a a leading uh, uh, country on global uh, governance. I mean, let's have this uh, world, uh, a world uh, infrastructure investment bank to, to set it up uh, to work with uh, together. So, so, so I think uh, that that's the global governance that, that we can really work on. I, I think probably I'm going to uh, uh, you know just to summarize uh, what what I've been saying, and uh, we'll leave some time for discussion. Is that uh, I think uh, uh, U.S. and China are, are really uh, uh, great uh, uh, countries, or one of one is the largest developed country, one is probably the largest developing country. Uh, even though there's a saying China should be graduating from developing country, but I still, still, you know, per, per capita wise, China is still uh, very far behind. It's only one uh, one sixth of what the uh, U.S. has now. Uh, but of course, since China has a 1.4 billion population, uh, nobody in the world has governed uh, uh, has 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 a has, has a, a, a really proven model. To govern a, a 1.4 billion people, uh, or maybe serving 1.4 billion people in the past. So, what has been experimented in China, I think so far probably uh, is okay. Is that because uh, uh, you know is at least maintain the, the the fastest growth uh, for the last several decades, maintain the great um, uh, transformation of, of uh, one fifth of a global population. It has maintained uh, uh, you know positive growth contribution for the world economy. And, and also, hopefully, uh, China will, will get along with everyone. I mean, historically, China was always a peace-loving country, always been neutral. Uh, that's Confucius, always seek a neutral ground, uh, never, never uh, occupied any countries, uh, never sent a soldier to any other countries. Uh, uh, even, even during the, um, you know, uh, Ming Dynasty, uh, which is uh, 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 several hundred years ago in the 14th, 15th century, um, China has a, a, a you know, marshal which has uh, uh, led a seven expedition uh, fleet, traveled to uh, Southeast Asia, traveled to uh, the, almost Africa. They never colonized any any places. You know, China. That was also that was almost one hundred years ahead of Columbus discovering the uh, American continent. So you see, you know, Chinese philosophy and the culture, and it's it's I you know, it's uh, I and is is uh, is uh, it's it's uh, more peace loving, and uh, you know, not really going to um, uh, seek any any uh, expansion of that. So 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 I understand there's there's some conflict, there's some um, uh, disagreement, there's some. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, criticism on China, but but, but let's you know uh, have a dialogue, have talk, and uh, see what what's going to happen on that. So uh, so I think uh, I want to uh, say that uh, uh, China and US are really a great uh, partners if they work together, and then they can really make a world a better place. We can't have this this trap happen. Uh, the other day when I talked to Graham Allison, he was basically saying uh, no one wants to have this fight. Uh, 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 for this, uh, uh, you know, conflict, military conflict, because uh, uh, I was also talking to Dashian at the beginning that uh, uh, you know these days, no, uh, you know, any people leaving these days, we we don't have anybody has experienced the real war. The war, uh, Graham Allison said, can destroy you know forty, fifty million people, 
And uh, so if the war is broke out, uh, he said, uh, when I was having dialogue with me, that you know, the place that you are in Beijing is going to be gone. The place I'm in Boston is gone. You know, we, <laughs> the US is gone, China is gone. And uh, it's terrible. It, it won't be, you, you know, we should not allow that to happen. Uh, because people haven't really experienced the, 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 this horrific war that, uh, uh, you know, maybe, you know, that we, we really have to prevent that. Because that is, you know, prosperity of the world is is is, is really at risk. So, so I, I, I think I'm going to finish here, and uh, I, I want to once again thank, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Kazi and also uh, Dr. Dashian to uh, to invite me, and uh, I hope that uh, we'll have more dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Wang. That was. Uh, Inspiring and refreshing to hear your emphasis on what could be um, and what could happen through reconciliation and, and working together. Um, there are some questions uh, that are typed. I'd like to start though with one. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've talked about the, the, the need to uh, ease the tensions and the possibilities of working together I'd like to ask you, it's a two-part question. Uh, what one specific step would you like to see each country take to ease tensions? Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Krasi. Uh, uh, really great, a great question. I, I, what I would like to see, I, I, I think that uh, uh, one of the things, they, there's quite a few things they could do. First, I think this, uh, this John Kerry's upcoming visit is extremely important. That sent an enormous signal that uh, probably we haven't got a major U.S. Uh, official visiting China for the last several years. So, so that is really great. That that I'm, I'm sure they, they will not have uh, like Alaska. <laughs> they they're going to talk on the on, on the business and on the climate change. Uh, so that can be done. The, the other things things can be done on both sides. I think uh, uh, from both sides is that we can resume the consulate in Houston. We should mm -hmm. resume the consulate in Chengdu. Yeah. That's extremely important. I think that was, I don't know how that was shut down, it was really a mistake. Uh, the, the second thing we also should resume the tourist, uh, the journalist. There were some journalists ex expelled from US, also from China. I mean, you know, we need more coverage of those countries yes. uh, so that we can really know what's going on. So, so I think those things are, are, are really important, particularly these two consulates. I mean, that serves a, Western part of China and, and Western part of the US. So, so, so furthermore, I think that uh, pandemic wise, uh, they, there's many things that can be done that, uh, because uh, like uh, we should really have a, a climate, a, you know, pandemic summit uh, of some kind and with WHO and then uh, maybe we should coordinate a bit of this vaccine, uh, 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 COVAX or, or, or helping developing countries. Because I think un, un, until every country is safe, uh, you know, uh, its own country can be finally safe. So, so uh, even U.S. got all injected, but then if other countries still, uh, you know, is widely spread, I mean, we, we still have a, a, a deadlock there. So I, I really want to see China and the U.S. Uh, both are doing relatively well now and to really take a, a good action and work with each other. And finally, uh, on, on the climate change, I think this uh, this President Biden set up this uh, forty country mechanism is is great, and I really think that um, now both U.S. and China are leading this G uh, twenty group on climate change. I hope that uh, you know the upcoming G twenty will make some major progress on climate change if China and U.S. are on a, on the same wavelength. So so there's quite a few things can be done, uh, and of course also we probably should tour down the, the rhetoric, uh, the, the shouting match across the Pacific. And, um, and, and also let more, uh, um, you know, scholars, uh, academics and uh, 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 NGOs and social groups to talk about. So, so there's quite a few things we could work together. Yeah. Well, the second half of my question is implied by the first, and that is what specific things would you caution either country not to do? Yeah, that's a, 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 another equally good question. Uh, what I think is the, uh, uh, we should do is that uh, we should uh, really reframe, re restrict it, uh, you know, speak, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, very negative word. Uh, I mean, we, we experienced that uh, when, when Biden, Trump and uh, 
uh, Trump administration. I mean, every day we woke up, there's a sanction on China. I think we should really limit the sanction tools rather than you know, use this too often, too, too frequent. Um, you know, uh, uh, because uh, uh, you know, we have to really prove the fact and find, investigate or, or have a more third party uh, uh, observation uh, so, so that we don't easily sanction each other. I, I, I don't think that is really a good idea because that really, uh, basically we, we are, we are, we are, we are accept, accelerate the, the, the tension. And also we should avoid of, uh, uh, you know, sending uh, public aircraft or, or, or uh, the uh, uh, military uh, exercise uh, uh, along the borders of each other, you know, uh, which is also no good, which, which also creates tension. So I think, you know, uh, there's quite a few things can be done and uh, we, we, we should calm down, have a more uh, this kind of visits and dialogue uh, so we can really uh, stop the, this downward spiral and stabilize the relation. Uh, that's probably the most important. Yeah. Uh, just a, a, as a comment, the saddest figure uh, that I heard from your, from your lecture is that there are, I know there are about 400,000 Chinese studying in America, but that there are only 10,000 students from the United States and China is a damning and um, discouraging number. We, we certainly need to increase the exchange of students and in my country to expand the teaching of Chinese language um, in the United States. I think that would go a, a, an enormous distance to um, ease the tensions and narrow the chasm between the nations. So, uh, there are some questions that have sure. come in. I encourage people to type in a few. We don't have much time because uh, Dr. Wang has to go to another meeting uh, at, his, at the conference. But uh, this is a specific question and, and I'm just going to read it. The mm -hmm. so-called wolf warrior diplomacy has been criticized by analysts outside China as part of China's assertive and aggressive foreign policy. But inside China, it seems to enjoy strong support. This sounds like the United States. Should China keep this type of diplomacy or return to a more low key foreign policy as advocated by Deng Xiaoping? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for that question. I see there's quite a few questions. I, I can answer that, no problem. And. Uh, uh, well, what I what I see that uh, is that uh, there's probably uh, uh, on both sides there's some you know improvement. But why is that? Uh, uh, China has been been rising, you know, developing for the last four decades. Probably, you know, uh, um, some people think, oh, China was used to be very low profile, doesn't really speak much at the international events or talk very much. But you see, China now is uh, the whole young generation has come up. There's a social media. There's a one, you know, eight hundred million uh, netizens and things like that. China become more vocal. Uh, the, 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 the domestic demand, the domestic uh, 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 pressure is also strong. So, so I think that uh, you know, the problem with the, uh, some government officials, uh, you know, when China got to this magnitude and this this size. Uh, uh, you know, they probably has to reflect some of that, and uh, in terms of in their in their exchange with the world, but but whether that should be uh, uh, all at the same level or at uh, at uh, uh, at every uh, you know place, that probably can be uh, discussed. But I, I I do think that people sh could shouldn't use the um, old view, you know, or those Deng Xiaoping years uh, 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 view to view what has been happening in China because. You talk about the per capita, you talk about development, you talk about the China. It's, it's totally uh, uh, transformed from 20, 30 years ago. Just for example, China's GDP has gone up 12 times in the last 20, last, last 20 years uh, since China you know, joined WTO. So, 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 so I, I, I would think that uh, uh, Chinese voice, uh, being a diplomatic voice or whatever, would reflect some of that. Mm -hmm. But also, I think China is uh, is a more uh, a, a, a country is more culturally collective. You know, so individually don't like to speak very much. Uh, even you, I'm sure you probably have experience when you're teaching in a class. Your, your American student is, is very spoke out, or as Chinese student, are shy sometimes, don't talk, or maybe more conservative. 
So, so in a case like that, if they are overwhelmed by uh, you know Western or some Western media's uh, uh, tax or criticism, there, there's not not many Chinese people saying that. So you end up only the uh, you know officials probably come out to defend, and then that give a, a impression: oh, Chinese official may be talking too much. So, so there's there's several reasons for that. But of course, I I, I think that uh, China certainly needs a better narrative, uh, need need a more theory to explain China's uh, logic, why China is you know cultural wise, historical wise, and uh, uh, philosophical wise, and the value system. Why, why things work in China, why, why other system may not work in China. Uh, I mean, let's have more experiment, let's have more tolerance. So, so I think, you know, there's several reasons for that, but, but certainly uh, the Western media needs to be more accurately portrayed China as well. They, they really need to come to China uh, without a lens, maybe uh, really see China in, uh, from, uh, from different angles. So, so I think there's probably work can be done on both sides to improve that. There, there's a question here relating to that. Can climate talks be a common meeting point to springboard U.S.-China improvement in relations? Do you think it might be the only common ground for now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly think we need this, uh, to start something uh, uh, good. I, I, was, I was giving a 20-minute interview to BBC the other day, uh, you know, specific on this topic, uh, uh, which I'm saying that... Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. We we need uh, uh, you know any bit of good news is good news because we haven't got any good news on on, on bilateral relations. All negative, uh, one after another, reinforce each other. We really need some uh, uplifting. And I think you know uh, John Kerry, who knows China very well, who is a great champion of climate change. I, I talked to him. I know how how he really uh, view that. He actually he's a great. Uh, a uh, contributor to the Paris climate change deal. He said he has met President Xi and the Chinese division many times for this topic. So, so, so he's really uh, uh, dealing with the real challenge facing uh, the mankind. Rather than we are really talking about uh, those geopolitical differences or, or even geopolitical conflict, let's talk about some real conflict. Let's talk about this common threat. So that's one area I think we can really lift in, uh, some confidence on where China and US has the global moral duties to, to do that. Whereas also the other thing is this pandemic. We, the pandemic has keep us shut down. I, I want to see, uh, uh, I want to visit US. I haven't been able to <laughs> visit for the last year now. And uh, the year before uh, last year, I, I visited four times US. So, I mean, uh, it's really uh, sad to see that. So we hope that, uh, you know, US, China and uh, uh, EU and many other countries can work together, United Nations, WHO, can keep this really under control, but also preventing the future to happen. So that's the other area we can have a positive discussion. The, the third area is that uh, uh, great lifting would be re resume this uh, uh, consulate uh, in, in, in Houston and, and, and Chengdu. One of the, I just came back from Chengdu actually. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Chengdu, I grew up in Chengdu. I, I, I was in uh -huh. Chengdu last week. So many people complained to me, say, oh, now I'm going to the US. I cannot go to Chengdu to apply my visa. No, I have to go to Beijing. Or it's such a nuisance. You know, I mean, so many people, was, young people was, was not happy about that. I mean, let's do something on those things. So, so, so there's quite things. I think once we start some positive, we hope that we, we happen. We, we turn this, uh, stabilize the relation, even it's competitive and cooperative, but, but let's not deteriorate that. Uh Here's a, here's a very interesting and tough question that came in. Are there any insoluble problems between the countries? I think that uh, that that's something I, I'm, I'm a bit realistic on that now. And uh, where, where I, I see, uh, as Graham uh, Allison told me that, of course, there's always a bit of uh, one, one while well, uh, a rising power uh, trying to catch up with a uh, uh, ruling power, existing power, there's always some kind of a conflict. For example, he, he, he tabled that, uh, you know, out of the 16 uh, cases, you know, 12 of them end up in some kind of conflict. Of course, whether that's academically <laughs> uh, com complete uh, still uh, to be discussed, but I think there, there are also four cases are, are, are exceptions. We talk about this also. One case we discussed together about is Song Liao in in in, in Asian China, where they have actually managed about two or three hundred years peace. They signed a peaceful agreement. 
what, what I see that is that, uh, uh, you know, whereas when, when American take over UK, I mean, they, they, they really hasn't had a major big conflict. What, what I see that uh, is that, uh, so, so there's some conflict there. There's always been some, there, that's the structural problem challenge we have to face. Second is this uh, ideological value system. So, so this Oriental uh, uh, Confucius culture society, East Asian culture society, I had a very uh, impressive, uh, uh, you know, uh, I attended a very impressive cocktail with a, a former um, U.S. ambassador to China, uh, Terry Bernstein, uh, he has his farewell party. Basically, he said the Chinese economic success, he, att he attributes to three factors. Why is the, uh, uh, the, the hard working? I mean, in China, you come, you know, 724, you know, 996, whatever. It's everybody, everybody's busy. There's no, no long holidays or, or mm -hmm. enjoying a half months so, or but people easily take days off. It, all the time, they're working, still working very hard. Uh, so that's number one, uh, hard working. Second is this uh, family value, uh, Terry said. You know, China attaches greatly important to respect seniors, uh, to respect... Uh, uh, and the, the, the hierarchy, and uh, so people really willing to uh, to uh, to maybe even make a little sacrifice, but then maintain the, uh, a good order of that of, of the of, of the universe or, or the stability. So so that's probably different than than Western countries. Thirdly, is China has great importance to to education, because uh, China has a, every year have a nine million college graduates, and uh, uh, for the last four decades, China already trained one hundred seventy million people, the largest probably. A highly skilled workforce in the world, and that driving China's development as well. So, so you see that that is actually now with only one child uh, for the last generation, yeah. several generations working on on a child child education. Now, you, any more you go in China, there's, there's less shops now. There's more training classes, dancing classes, English classes. There's mm -hmm. 200 million people study English in China, largest English studying country in the world. So, so, so all those things really made China. Uh, somewhat different, and then you know, probably expand part of China's success. But if that is uh, is uh, is all interpreted as uh, auto uh, autocracy or, or CPC dictatorship or uh, things like that, then you know the the the, the two camps has a, has a very uh, different views, and it's really difficult to 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 match the the, the, the consensus. So so what, what I think is we, we really should expand this tourism. We should really expand these student exchanges and more people come to China and to know China and uh, and uh, and that understand. So so hopefully, you know, we have, if we have more understanding and also if we have economically intertwined, uh, for example, Tesla almost become the largest uh, company in the world last year because they have this factory newly uh, clean, um, auto, clean energy automobile uh, in production in China, you know, very well. Uh, that's that's where they happen. So 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 that that's really I I, I think that uh, we we need to understand the ideologically value system. So probably I I, I think the, the 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 it's not the end of history is absolutely right. We we probably should see uh, somewhat different uh, uh, models or different development path uh, that China experiment uh, that suitable for China. China never said it's going to export that or you're going to uh, promote that to the other country. China wants to you know, keep its own uh, uh, work at home and uh, to really satisfy its own people's demand. So that's probably, you know, that has to be better understood outside China. Mm -hmm. There, There's one more. I, we, I know we promised we'd let you get, get back to your meeting. I don't want to take all your time. Uh, there's one question I wasn't going to read because uh, it's, it's a little mm -hmm. bit... Serving, I saw that. No, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, on, on Xinjiang, and, right? I mean, uh, I heard that. Yes. No, I'm not going to. That. that okay. I, this, this was about Confucius, because you mentioned okay. Confucius, um, and as the lawyers say, you opened the door to this question. Uh, there's a question with uh, that, that said, "Would you be willing?" I think it was to me be, to recommend where we can find resources very similar to the Confucius Institute. And why did the institute get shut down? My question mm -hmm. to you is um, a, a, a personal statement. I became involved with China through the Confucius Institute. Mm -hmm. 14 years ago, I started at our university, uh, the first Confucius Institute in Texas. And all of those in Texas have now shut down for a variety of reasons that I think are sad because it promoted 
the kind of interaction you're talking about. Um, I don't know how China views the problem in America with the Confucius Institutes, but do you think it would be possible for our two nations to get together and create complementary institutes, uh, uh, an American institute in China and a, and a Confucius Institute uh, in the United States to serve the very purpose you've been talking about to promote interaction and learning at the level of education? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Very, very, uh, very deep thinking question. Uh, what, what I think is that uh, there's, there could be some uh, problem there is that China has been uh, doing very well uh, in China. Uh, uh, for example, China have this, uh, China, you know, in the Chinese society, they normally have a bit strong government led initiative. Uh, so, so that is totally acceptable in China because China thousands of years has always a strong central government and government is really uh, been an uh, integral part of, uh, uh, a very important part of, uh, of the society uh, as well. Uh, so even for this pandemic fighting uh, infrastructure or, or, or you know, all those great uh, things happen in China, the, the government uh, coordination, government uh, consistent working on that is really uh, uh, proved to be quite successful in China. But this Confucius Institute, of course, uh, uh, the Chinese government actually uh, initially supported that. Probably that has been viewed in the Western society, particularly in the US, because people like small government, people like uh, no government intervention, no government involvement, which I think the model may work very well in China, may not be really practical outside China. So that's where probably there's some uh, different views on that. And uh, the other thing is that I think, you know, in order to improve on, improve on, improve on that, we could have, uh, you know, privatize some Confucius Institute or maybe have a other multi, multi multilize the, the sources of funding and maybe, you know, uh, some internationally uh, acceptable practice, like, you know, US, you have a Fulbright scholar system, why can't we have the Confucius uh, <laughs> scholar system yeah. and things like that, we can diversify it. And so several, several, several ways to do that. So I think they are, they are changing a bit of that now. So now the Confucius has become a foundation. Uh, they, they want to publish through in the future with, with more variety. I think they are, they are thinking about that and they are thinking how to improve on that. But rather, but also the, the, the sometimes the interpretation in the US go to extreme. Oh, those are Confucius Institute are spies or the, uh, you know, kind, trying to uh, you know, do bad things. Not, not necessary. So, so, so I think there's a lot of a gap there that we need to understand each other, find a, a mutually acceptable way to do that. And uh, always, you know, we need that. I mean, in China, we have a 70s uh, center. We have, uh, uh, you know, Alliance Francais. We have uh, UK Cultural Center. We have all the international centers subsidized by the government. Uh, why not that in China is not a problem, whereas Confucius Center in the US is a problem. So, uh, I mean, uh, we, 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 we are lacking a good communication on that. I, I think that, that leads to a lot of uh, problems. Also, I saw there's a question on, on, on Xinjiang. I also yeah. probably can mention a few words. I, I think that uh, uh, there's already 2,000 foreign visitors uh, been to Xinjiang. And uh, uh, the, actually, the, uh, the, uh, one of the ambassadors told me uh, he visited Xinjiang. He said he never saw uh, more, more mosque uh, temples in Xinjiang, in, in Xinjiang than in any other countries that he has visited. So, so, so I, I, I think that uh, there's a, there were several years ago, there's a huge terrorist uh, attacks everywhere. Hundreds of people lost lives. I think Chinese government has never dealt that question before. They, they, they have experimented some ways to contain that, of course. Uh, but, uh, but uh, of course, uh, maybe, uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism. And then the Chinese actual government actually announced last year, all the, uh, uh, trainees in, in education uh, uh, schools has all been graduated already. So, so that, has, uh, that has been announced again and again. So they welcome uh, foreigners to visit Xinjiang, uh, journalists or, mm -hmm. or uh, ambassadors, and, uh, and if, if they are not coming with a per conclusion, I mean, they are all welcome to visit. And uh, I was talking to uh, Tom Friedman, he was saying, oh, maybe New York Times can send a a team there. I'm, I'm sure if uh, if uh, if that possible, that'd be that'd be great as well. So so I think there's the, of course there, there's some personal account 
outside China. But but I don't think that that is a statistically uh, significant, you know, big enough case. For example, let's talk about uh, one million, uh, two million, or three million Uyghurs locked up and things like that, or even call that genocide. But you know, what's what's the proof of that? Where where does this first one million, two million citation comes from? Uh, I, I really uh, don't know. I mean, who who said that? Oh, they said there's some satellite pictures. But satellite picture, there's, there's a lot of empty buildings in China. I mean, China is always building a lot of buildings, a lot of empty buildings there. Um, uh, you can't just ask me there's a big building, that there must be 10,000 people in there. No, I mean, uh, those buildings, even from satellite, looks empty as well. So, so I, I really hope that uh, we can have a solid cases, not just anecdotes, individual account. Um, there's not, always people not happy. Of course, China can do better. I'm, I'm sure the Xinjiang government can do better as well. Uh, but really, we need a, a more uh, uh, understanding. So I think this uh, U.S. President Biden announcement, they're going to put in all the old troops of Afghanistan is great because mm -hmm. that's where uh, many years ago was the Xinjiang, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a terrorist based on uh, or maybe influenced by them. So that's neighboring Xinjiang as well. So I think if we can really solve the regional tension, uh, we're, we're used to also some people, uh, John ISIS from Xinjiang. So, so. Uh, I think this international attention on Xinjiang will, will certainly uh, make China more aware of that, and, and of course uh, continue to improve on that. And uh, but but not I'm proportionally saying it's a, a genocide compared that with Hitler or or, 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 or or something like that, which is not 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 act accurate. I think. Well, I'd like Dr. to ask the last question if possible. Yes, I was going to ask Dashwan to ask the last question. <laughs> Sure, you sure. know, uh, I know you're, you're very short of time now, but I want to go quickly. This is, a, I think it's an important one. Uh, Allison, uh, Graham Allison talked about the Thucydides trap and the examples uh, he gave that two powers will eventually come to war. Um, but all the examples that he cited don't have two ingredients. One, we don't have, they don't have climate change. Uh, with climate change, we don't know whether we're going to last to the 21st or uh, 22nd century if yes. we continue. And that's number one. Secondly, the two powers in all the examples he talked about were not nuclear powers. Each mm -hmm. could destroy the world. So with these two issues, can we, especially US and China, can come together and have some sense and say that we cannot have wars. Absolutely, no, uh, I think you are right. I mean, the, the circumstances and the historical settings are, are quite different uh, than it used to be. It's and, profoundly and, uh, different. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree with you. I, I think uh, that, 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 that is really true. And, uh, but still, I think, we, I think his, uh, his alarm was also, uh, his warning is, uh, is also, uh, make people thinking as well, because I think even though all those technological uh, 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 advances has, has, has changed or even nuclear deterrent has, uh, has they been there, uh, I, I think there's a little different than the Soviet Union Cold War time, where the both Soviet Union and US and the Western allies out of the Second World War. Right. That's why even though they had this Cold War, they still talk down, they still conduct many rounds of uh, disarmament and the arms control agreement has reached. Right. So, so, so there was, was, there was aware of how, how cruel, how, how terrible the war was. But now, the, 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 any living beings now, uh, undoubtedly still many live now who has experienced the real, you know, worldwide war. Uh, so, 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 so I think we really need to, uh, you know, avoid that. But, but I'm also, I'm, I'm worried about this chain of command, you know, that, uh, uh, for example, if you have this uh, aircraft to carry uh, circulating, Taiwan Street or China, you have an airplane flying over too often, too, too, too many times. There could be a little uh, clash somewhere. And then, uh, and then, 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 then escalation may happen. You know, <laughs> human beings' nature <laughs> sometimes right. hasn't been really changed that much. So, 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 so the, I still worry about that. For example, the, I don't know uh, why there was, there was a bomb of the Chinese embassy at the Yugoslavia, <laughs> uh, right. you know, many years ago. So, so, you know, let's avoid this uh, close contact, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, short distance of uh, conflict. Because, you know, as, even though the top leadership doesn't want to get into that, but maybe the, the middle, middle, <laughs> middle layer or the middle commander maybe or, or lose control or maybe somebody's crazy uh, commit a suicide or something, you know, push the button. 
uh, we, we may start into an unnecessary and, and, and deadly war. So I'm still worried about that. I, I really think we should uh, avoid that because after all, uh, you're right. You know, China now has the 50% of the tourist buildings in the world. I mean, China right. probably is the least one to get into the war. You have three gorgeous dam. You have the longest uh, ocean bridge in the world. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, same as the U.S. The prosperity and and, and, right. and uh, uh, peaceful life people join for generations. Uh, you won't, won't, you know, we'll be ruined if we if we don't really uh, take this seriously. So, so I also tackle even technical decouple is not not necessary because we are intertwined with shared prosperity. If we technically divide, if we tackle, it also is really no good. So, so I really think that. Uh, we should have a rational thinking and uh, and more kind of a uh, dialogue uh, uh, and uh, exchanges are really needed on those countries in many uh, aspects, in many fields and in many different groups as well. Okay. Dr. Wang, uh, thank you so much. You know, before Thucydides, there was a Greek historian named Herodotus. Mm -hmm. And Herodotus was the first, quote, Western writer and thinker to go to Asia in order to understand it. Uh, and, the, and the preface to his great work, The Histories, was he was writing to celebrate the remarkable achievements of both East and West and explore the causes for friction between them. Uh, and thank you for, for being a modern Herodotus. You have <laughs> talked about the possibilities of a better world through the collaboration of East and West while being very aware of the frictions that could stop or even halt, even halt, halt, halt that progress. Um, I hope that your voice of optimism prevails both in China and the United States. Thank you so much for visiting with us and for your thoughtful, reasoned, and inspiring remarks. And I hope to see you at the next International Advisory Council of the Center for Asian Studies. Good night, everybody, and good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazan. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shah Dashen. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.